So let's start off with the national and state system. Prior to the Work Choices Framework introduced in 2005, each state had its own industrial relations framework in addition to a nat national framework, with the exception of Victoria, whose government referred its system to the Commonwealth. From 2005 onwards, the Commonwealth used its powers under the Corporations Act to unify industrial relations under a single national framework. The exemption was to state government employees who remained under the restrictive either their respective state industrial relations framework. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, what you're seeing here is it's the, the Corporations Act um, was used by the government to unify, to unify the system. So you used to have eight state and territory industrial relations systems and a national system. So the national system would cover um, certain types of employees, but it was quite limited. Most of them were state. Um, from 2005 onwards, work choices here unified that under a national system. Most states then referred any additional employees up to the national system, so small business owners, unincorporated businesses. Um, I should say more specifically, uh, they weren't covered by the Corporations Act because they're unincorporated. They were then referred up to the national government as well. So now virtually all private sector employees and all Commonwealth government employees are covered by the, uh, this national, where have we got, uh, this national framework. And the exception is state government employees. So New South Wales, Victorian, Queensland and so on, uh, each have government employees that are covered by the state framework. Alright, moving on, we want to focus on the national framework. So we want to focus on the national framework because that is predominantly what we look at now. Um, and there are, these are what we looked at last lesson. So minimum employment standards, and um, they're things like your annual leave and your sick leave, um, certain other things. Minimum wages is a separate point, but that's also part of this minimum employment standards. Um, there is a minimum wage which you cannot go below, and that is determined every year. Um, and unions will make their case, employer associations will make their case in order to try and raise that minimum wage. Um, awards are actually now referred to as modern awards in the national framework. So they used to be called awards, they're now modern awards because they've been modernised. Uh, there are fewer of them, there is just the one across the country. Um, so above your minimum employment standards, that is the national minimum, the safety net, you cannot go below it. Uh, you have awards and whatever industry you're in, the awards will add additional pay and conditions uh, above that minimum employment standards. They cannot go below the national um, minimum standard, so they, they can only add to it. On top of that, you may have an enterprise agreement. Okay? That enterprise agreement is an agreement between the employees and the employer in a particular workforce. Uh, and in this case, again, that cannot undermine the award. So you've got your national standards, your award can build on top of that, the enterprise agreement can build on top of that, they cannot undermine each other. Um, and your employment contracts for high income owners, they're quite limited these days. You used to have Australian workplace agreements under work choices and under the um, Workplace Relations Act prior to that. And they allowed you to actually undermine not just the enterprise agreement, but also the award and even some of the minimum employment standards oftentimes subject to a no disadvantage test, so you needed to be better off overall. Um, and that usually meant being paid more in order to you, you cash in your sick leave, your annual leave, your um, penalty rates, those sorts of things, in exchange for a higher wage. Um, they're very limited these days, so these days you can undermine your enterprise agreement, but you have to maintain your minimum employment standards and your award and your minimum wage. It's very restrictive in terms of what you can actually um, exchange for higher pay. Alright, so let's have a look at dispute resolution. Industrial disputes can be resolved either, either, sorry. either by conciliation or, a, a book. or arbitration. arbitration. Excellent. Can you read the second point as well? Conciliation occurs when the union and employer are opposite to appear before an independent mediator to resolve their disputes. It is voluntary and not binding. Okay, that's, that last point is the important one. It's voluntary and not binding. So conciliation um, is basically mediation, for those of you who've heard that term in other contexts. Uh, you've got a, um, an employer and generally a union. They can't come to an agreement. They decide we're going to go to a, um, a, a mediator usually to have conciliation. And conciliation uh, is voluntary. They both have to volunteer to appear before it. If one of them decides not to, they don't have to. And it's also not binding. Okay, so at the end of it, they don't have to accept the decision of the um, 
uh, whoever is leading the, that conciliation. So an example would be um, a union is asking for um, a pay rise of 10% over two years. The employer is saying, we're going to give you 9% over three years. So instead of 5% a year pay rise, they're offering 3% a year pay rise over a longer period of time. Uh, they may go to conciliation and whoever is leading the conciliation may say, look, um, instead of giving you guys a higher pay rise uh, like the union wants, how about you accept the 3% per year that the employer is providing, but the employer provides maybe additional payment for um, education and training to upskill the workers and uh, the union may accept that and say, okay, we're getting something for that. The employer may be happy to do it because they're getting a more skilled workforce and they're willing to um, put that into the agreement. And at the end of it, the union may say, yes, we agree to it. So it's not binding, but we've decided to agree. We're going to recommend to our members that they vote in favor of it. Um, so it's, it is voluntary and it is not binding. Okay? The union may decide at the end, you know what? No, we want a pay rise. What we really want is money in our pocket. Arbitration occurs when the union and employer are forced to appear before the Fair Work Commission to resolve their dispute. It is binding but can only occur under limited circumstances. Arbitration can occur by agreement between the union and employer after a serious or sustained breach of good faith bargaining orders by one of the parties. On public interest grounds such as disputes affecting the essential services or damaging a significant part of the economy. In the special low-pay bargaining stream, where parties are unable to negotiate a first agreement after extensive efforts. Okay, that first point, thank you for that. That first point is very similar to what we saw earlier. So it's this voluntary agreement. They both decide to not just go to conciliation, but go to arbitration. And that means that they will have to accept the decision at the end. Arbitration is binding. You must accept the decision at the end. Uh, this one, we talked about uh, good faith bargaining earlier. The idea that you have to make a serious attempt. You can't just railroad uh, the employer or the union and refuse to bargain at all. Um, and if there is serious or sustained breach of good faith bargaining, if you do have this, then um, one of the parties can apply for arbitration. Okay, so this is part of the current uh, framework. You are required to have good faith bargaining. If you don't make a serious attempt to bargain, then you can be forced to accept arbitration. This third one, this is interesting because this is the, uh, the Qantas case study that we've talked about in, in the past, the public interest ground. So what happened in the Qantas case was that it was this one. It was a significant part of the economy. Okay? Um, it was also, you could say, it was an essential service. It's 50% of the domestic airline. So if you have a, um, for example, the police going on strike, um, the police is a bad example because they're state government um, employees. Uh, but if you had a um, something that's considered an essential service or that damages a significant part of the economy, like a seaport or an airline, the economy relies on that quite significantly, then on public interest grounds, you can actually have arbitration. And they can be forced to go to arbitration. And that's exactly what happened with Qantas. Qantas grounded its fleet. The government said, you need to start getting your planes back in the air. The union needs to stop having their strikes. And you're both going to arbitration. The last one is this special case for low paid workers. So there's a special low, low paid bargaining stream as well. So we're not going to talk about it too much. Um, the main ones I would say is actually the first three. And this third one is the one that um, is most high profile. Okay, it's very limited cases under which you can have arbitration. Uh, before we go to the questions, there's just a, a graph that you guys don't have. So you may want to write just uh, down some information about this. What this is, is days lost to industrial disputes. Okay. Every year, you have a certain number of days uh, when uh, unions decide to go on strike, workers go on strike. And this tells you how many days that is. And I've, I've split this up into roughly, because this is a whole year amounts, roughly into the workplace relations um, period, into the work choices period, and over here, the fair work period. And you can see that um, it was actually quite high during the 90s and the early half of uh, the noughties under the workplace relations. I get about 619 days per year lost to industrial disputes. So it climbed quite significantly, started falling. As soon as work choices came in, you had a big drop off. Notice here there's a big drop off. I know the trend was also down, but um, it dropped off and it remained low, down to about 185 days. Under the Fair Work Act, it did increase slightly, uh, mainly because you didn't have this, this low point here, um, but it has remained fairly uh, stable at about 203 days. So since work choices, it hasn't actually increased much significantly. Um, so if you want some, uh, some idea on the effectiveness of the different frameworks, 
you want to write down Workplace Relations Act, 619 days per year lost to industrial disputes. More, more, more days lost than there are days in the year because you can have multiple workplaces going on strike. Okay, so if there are two workplaces going on strike for, uh, on the same day. for two days, say uh, we have two workforces, one goes on strike Monday, Tuesday, another one goes on strike Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, that's five days lost. That's five days lost to industrial disputes. Um, and so it, you do get more than 365 days a year in some years. If you have multiple workplaces going on strike, um, in one workplace, if they go on strike for two weeks, that's a lot more disruptive than going on strike for one day. And that's why we look at number of days lost rather than number of strikes. Okay, if you have a one day strike or a half day strike, it's a lot less disruptive. So I would write this down, the number of days lost for each one. 619, 185, and 203. Um, I would add that to your information. And you can cite that and say, number of days lost to industrial disputes has fallen um, and has remained low for the last... 10 years or so. Uh, no, but you can quote the Australian Bureau of Statistics for this one. So the ABS is where I got this data from.